Hello, and thanks for joining us for SNG Live, Enhancing AI and Government. I'm Dave Nazepper, tech reporter at FedScoop, and I'll be moderating our next panel. Joining me is a great lineup featuring Alam Tabasi, Chief of Staff at the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST, and Tasha Austin, Principal at Deloitte. We'll spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing the latest developments in AI and the things agencies need to know to begin their AI journeys. To start us off, does government still struggle to understand what AI is, and if so, how can education be improved? Tasha, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks Dave, and thanks for having me. Um, I do think the topics of AI can sound quite complicated. Um, I think there's a lot of fear that comes with that topic when people are trying, trying to digest um, what AI really means. However, um, I do believe that there is an overwhelming sense of curiosity about what AI is and how we can integrate AI technology into um, our work, our day-to-day -day work um, to improve operations as well as uh, customer experiences. Um, the broad definition of AI refers to the simulation of human intelligence and machines, making them capable of performing tasks that typically require human action. Um, and as at Deloitte, we, we refer to this as AI being about humans and machines working together to yield a far greater outcomes than either can do on its own. Uh, when we think about machine learning algorithms and platforms powered by artificial intelligence and analytics, it, it's really becoming the mainstream. Um, at Deloitte, we refer to this as the age of with uh, humans working with machines, uh, humans um, working with AI. Um, we say the technology is smart, but we make sure the way it's used is smarter. Um, and when you think about AI, it can you know, consist of everything from process robotics to uh, machine learning to optimization. Um, it can be used in a variety of different ways across government um, to include things like predictive aircraft maintenance, uh, resource need allocation, as well as back office um, automation. And so for organizations or leaders looking to learn more um, about AI, there's certainly a breadth of information available online. Um, I think Deloitte, you know, we've tried to amplify sort of our role um, in the conversation around the topics of AI for our clients um, and other stakeholders to help our clients understand uh, best practices and, and scalable solutions for their, their AI use cases. We think about um, how we prepare organizations for the future of work. Um, we talk to our clients about understanding the, the current state of AI regulations and policies. And so we accomplish a lot of that with our Artificial Intelligence Institute at Deloitte to really help our audiences make sense of the AI landscape. So that's another way where you can um, rely on industry expertise to really help educate agencies on you know, what AI is and, and how it can be applied throughout the organization. I think one other final thought is, you know, since AI uh, adoption and maturity can vary, um, organizations can certainly learn a lot from each other. Um, there certainly are organizations and departments or program offices that are much more sophisticated and very successful in their adoption of AI technology. And organizations should continue to find ways to collaborate and really gain insights from each of their efforts. Now on the policy side of things, I wanted to talk about what the uh, latest federal memos and executive orders on AI have accomplished. Um, I was hoping you could share a little bit of your thoughts on that. Um, sure, and uh, again, uh, uh, thanks very much for having me in this panel. Um, on the uh, executive orders and uh, memos, uh, so back in 2019, February 2019, executive order was issued on maintaining US leadership that basically brought, uh, set a, a broad uh, vision and agenda and uh, strategy for AI uh, in the United States. Uh, NIST has some tasking for development of a plan for federal engagement in development of standards. Um, then back in uh, November 2020, uh, again, uh, uh, responding to the tasks within that uh, February 2019 executive order, uh, OMB issued a guidance for regulations of artificial intelligence applications. Uh, this memorandum set out policy consideration that should guide, uh, to the extent permitted by law, regulatory and non-regulatory oversight of AI application developed and uh, deployed outside of the federal government. Uh, although federal agencies currently use AI in many ways to perform their mission, government use of AI was declared out of scope of that memorandum. 
Uh, that memorandum laid out principles for stewardship of AI applications that consistent with law agencies should take into consideration um, when formulating regulatory and non-regulatory approach and basically uh, asked for uh, uh, considering uh, innovation and making sure that uh, a regulation is only applied when it's needed and not any um, innovations. It also mentioned non-regulatory approaches such as use of the framework guidance and voluntary consensus uh, uh, standards. Um, uh, then in to, uh, December 2020, an executive order was issued on promoting the use of trustworthy artificial intelligence in federal government. Uh, and the idea was that agencies uh, are using and they, they wanted to continue use of AI even appropriate uh, to benefit American people. Uh, and But the ongoing adoption and acceptance of the AI will depend on uh, public trust and public confidence in AI. Uh, so it set out some sort of the principles uh, 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 for use of AI in federal government uh, for purposes uh, other than national security and defense. Um, so that the use of the AI is uh, to ensure that the use of AI is consistent with our nation's value and beneficial to public. Um, it also establishes a process for implementing those principles through common policy guidance across agencies. Um, there are other agencies that have come up with their own uh, basically guidelines and principles for use of AI. Um, and then uh, in the statute, uh, the NDAA uh, uh, has an AI Initiative Act and uh, establishes a, a national initiative office uh, within OSDP uh, and uh, tasks and ideas for advancement of um, particularly trustworthy and responsible AI and U.S. leadership for those. Now, with all the, uh, the activity on the AI front at the federal level, obviously we need the AI talent and government uh, to be able to, to act. Uh, and I'm curious, what sorts of upskilling efforts uh, at the federal level do you think we need, Tasha? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I do think it's important for leadership to upskill and support current employees so that they can adopt AI technology and, and the new processes. Um, just in general, if leaders create and promote a culture of learning and development, uh, this can really help grow skills and capabilities. It can certainly encourage innovation. Um, it can create new opportunities for the employees as well as the organization as a whole. Um, it can also improve employee uh, retention and engagement. Um, it can increase collaboration between the departments and really speed up the adoption of some of the new and latest and greatest emerging technologies across the company. Um, so leaders should really think about what learning and development pathways and, and trainings and communications and, and conversations need to happen to really ensure um, an AI ready workforce that really continues to stay adaptable to changes in technology that are inevitable uh, to AI or with AI. Um, you know, what I will say, Dave, is that uh, this is really a cultural shift. Um, you know, you heard me talk a little bit about fear earlier when we opened up the conversation on just how do we define AI. Um, so really with this cultural shift, employees need to really understand and they need to be on a journey um, and leadership must be clear about the organization's AI strategy and its value to the organization. Uh, the fears and concerns, you know, of the workforce must be addressed. Um, leadership must explain the ways in which AI can benefit uh, the employee experience and eliminate administrative or, or repetitive tasks, allowing them to have more time to, to spend on more meaningful and productive work. Um, humans and machines are an inevitable part of the future, and we, we really need to continue to move towards a workforce that's very comfortable with machines taking the work out of the task and, and really having employees provide uh, meaningful contributions to the mission. And so doing something as simple as, you know, training employees on AI fluency, uh, helping them understand the different types of AI concepts and its applicability uh, to re relevant use cases is certainly a great place to start. Um, and I do think that, you know, the government is starting to rely even on industry expertise to figure out how they sort of take the, the organization on that a journey to upskill talent in that area. Now, one of the areas that uh, NIST has been particularly active is in, in this area of 
trustworthy AI and guidance on trustworthy AI. I'm curious, Alan, if you can share a little bit about what guidance is in the work and what trustworthy AI even means for the people who don't know that term. And then Tasha, maybe you can uh, share with us a little bit about why AI ethics are so important. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. It's really important. Uh, I start by saying a few things about NIST, that uh, NIST has a long-standing reputation for cultivating trust in technology by participating in development of standards and metrics, both domestically inside the US, but also internationally. Uh, standards and metrics that strengthen measurement science and make technology more secure, usable, interoperable, and reliable. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the cybersecurity framework and the privacy framework that NIST had put out. And um, this work is critical in AI space to ensure public trust of this rapidly evolving technology. Uh, our primary focus in AI is to establish the building blocks for trustworthy AI. That's exactly the, what you asked, that what constitutes trust, what we really mean by uh, trustworthy AI. And, uh, and, and Dan's answer to that is that uh, uh, while there has been, uh, um, and, and we are uh, encouraged uh, by that, that there has been many um, progress in developing principles for trustworthy AI in private sector around the world, um, and most famously everybody else are familiar with the OECD principles, um, there's often a gap between articulating these high-level value-based statements about trustworthy AI and uh, and the and the gap and the technical gap is that how to turn them into technical requirements that can be used for design, development, use, and test of AI system. Um, so uh, when these all, all these principles are high level value based and all on the right direction, the opportunity for us, the tech community, is to take these principles and bring them into the practice to translate them into technical requirements that can be. Uh, used by developer when they're developing the systems, evaluator and tester when they're testing the systems. And that's exactly what we're trying to do at NIST. And the first step is to answer the question of what constitutes trust uh, or what's the taxonomy of risk. We, you know, I'm, I'm switching the risk and trust uh, because uh, they are the two sides of the one coin. Um, the, the, in in uh, collaboration with the whole community, we have come up with the eight dimensions of the uh, uh, trust or taxonomy of risk. Uh, we first, the system uh, want them to be um, certainly accuracy is important. We want to be accurate, but beyond that, we want them to be safe and reliable. We want them to be secure and resilient to many different vulnerability and attacks. We want them to be robust so they can be uh, uh, maintain the same level of performance for the data and environment not seen during the um, training. We want them to be explainable and interpretable, and we want them to. Uh, uh, be free from bias and bias is mitigated to the extent possible and privacy preserving. Um, uh, the, after uh, identifying this taxonomy of risk and uh, the, what comes to trust, the next question is that what do we mean by each of them? Uh, it is often the case uh, that we are uh, referring to the same term, meaning two different things. Uh, so it's important to bring the whole community on a shared understanding of what exactly mean uh, by each of this word. Uh, simple words such as bias or uh, complex words such as explainable, they can uh, mean different things to different groups. And the challenge is, uh, uh, is um, uh, uh, more complicated here because as we all know, AI is a multidisciplinary field and we're trying to bring perspectives from uh, uh, many different disciplines from uh, computer scientists, developers, to mathematicians and statisticians, all the way to psychologists, sociologists, um, people that care about uh, the implementations and deployment of the AI in societies. Um, so uh, that is answering the question of uh, what it is that we want to measure. Once we know what it is that we want to measure, we start working on how to measure and development of the metrics testbed uh, 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 evaluation and benchmark to uh, quantify and assess each of these uh, uh, dimensions of trust. Uh, and by having them all together, we can have a good scientific foundations uh, to develop a risk management framework uh, where uh, we provide enough uh, information, data, uh, tools, and method for understanding, identifying, and assessing a different risk such that um, uh, the application owner, the user, can uh, do the right uh, risk benefit analysis um, uh, and uh, come up with the right decisions for uh, the AI systems. Uh, 
uh, in doing so, we started a series of the workshops uh, and, uh, of course, research and uh, producing documents. Uh, we had workshops on um, a, a kickoff on uh, what constitutes uh, trust and trustworthiness, uh, followed by the workshops on bias, explainability, and publications around uh, uh, terminology uh, uh, and taxonomy for adversarial machine learning, um, the four principles of explainable AI, uh, and a report on bias in AI is going to go out. Uh, I have to mention that NIST uh, carries its uh, work in a close uh, consultation and collaboration with the whole industry. So all of our workshops, workshops are open for participation uh, by whoever is interested. And our uh, documents, we send it out for public comment. So we make sure that the input from the um, experts uh, uh, around the globe really um, is, uh, is sought and incorporated in our documents. And Dave, I think that Elham outlined that very nicely. You know, the only thing you know I would just go back and reemphasize is that you know the ethics are important in AI because we must absolutely must be accountable for the decisions and outcomes made by AI technology to really build confidence in the technology and to ensure that the technology is not biased, not discriminatory, or in violation of human rights. Uh, there must be of processes in place to really understand how the algorithms work um, and to evaluate the technology to ensure its outcomes um, behave as intended. And, and Deloitte has a trustworthy AI framework um, that lays out six key dimensions that align exactly with what Elham said when she was outlining the NIST, um, the way they NIST thinks about trustworthy AI and the eight dimensions. And so, um, you know, we, all, we need to consider that. And, and when we consider it collectively, all of the different dimensions, it really does build the trust that we're looking for in AI. Now, this next question is for both of you, but Tasha, maybe you can start us off with agencies embarking on these AI projects. Uh, obviously, data sharing can quickly become a hurdle uh, to many of these. And I'm curious, uh, how big a problem is this and how can agencies begin to tackle this issue? Uh, I definitely think it's a big issue. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, a well thought out or laid out solution, but what I can say is with the right uh, stakeholders around the table and walking them through sort of the value of, of the AI and what, what the, the organization is trying to accomplish and what that means as far as data and how it will be used and how it will be protected. And even when Elham mentioned the sort of the risk management framework, how do we factor that in to those discussions? I do think it starts to you know, provide some comfort um, and, and allows a, you know, some, some, for some additional data sharing. Um, typically speaking, depending on AI and machine learning, the model being developed, it is ideal to have access to a broad cohort of data to really increase the diversity, edge, case, edge cases, and, and breadth that will make the analysis more reflective of the population. Um, the issue with data sharing are, in many instances, policies or regulations of you know, how the data can be used and, and, and other issues to include privacy, uh, data quality, uh, and compatibility of systems. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, I think this is about bringing the right stakeholders to the table um, to have the conversations on what's the organization trying to do, um, what data needs, um, you know, will help move the organization forward with implementing different types of AI technologies. What does that mean from a data perspective? How will it be shared? Who will have access to it? How will it certainly be protected? I think the more open and transparent uh, the stakeholders can be about those conversations, the easier it may be to share data. And, and the hope is that going forward, the government will continue to advance those conversations and move uh, towards a place with broader data sharing as permissible. Uh, yeah, excellent points are raised. I agree with all of them. Uh, I just want to highlight the uh, uh, importance of uh, secure and private data sharing. And as we're thinking about sharing data on uh, and I agree with everything Tasha said about making sure that you know there is a mechanism to talk about the providence, how the data was collected, for what uses, so uh, we can actually use the data for what it was uh, intended for. Um, we have to also be mindful about um, incorporating privacy preserving uh, techniques and methods, uh, both at the data on algorithm um, to protect the privacy. Um, and the same also goes for the security. So in the, the, the issues of the data integrity, data quality, data privacy, and data security are really, really important and should be, um, should be addressed and 
carefully thought of. Well, on that note, I think we're just about out of time, but I want to thank you both for joining us today for a great discussion. I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the rest of our SNG Live. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Johan. Yeah, thanks, Vasha.